ever had a time with so much social, political, and economic uncertainty. I can't imagine a time with more of it than right now, and um, pretty much historically unprecedented in all those times. And what that has done a lot of is create some unique opportunities for the right people in the right places and made certain types of businesses very hard to do. And so we've seen in the investment landscape just this huge difference in returns over the last year between one type of investment versus another. And that really hasn't been typical over the last um, 10 to 20 to 30 years. Um, what you've tended to find uh, more in the past is things tended to move a little bit more correlated. Um, so we're going to go into some of the strategies, some of the contribution strategies. And when we really look at the five key concerns for our clients, um, I believe investing and doing the right thing with their investments is number one. You know, they always want to mitigate taxes and make their cash flow go further. Um, transferring assets and state planning to pass assets for heirs, always important. Wealth protection, so your money's not unjustly taken, very important. And charitable giving strategies to leverage the tax benefits for the causes you care about, very important. But of all those, in interweaving all those is usually some type of an investment plan. And so... We're going to talk about what you can be doing specifically now, especially in a pre-retirement mode with your investments to make the most of it. And when you look at the possibilities of all these different um, areas over here, what we're really talking about is how do we end up funding retirement? And when you look at the investments in 401k side, that has become a much bigger piece of people's retirement funding in the last 30 years than it ever was before. And a lot of that has to do with some historic mistakes, which we will, or maybe not mistakes, but unintended consequences, which we'll talk about for a second. And then also um, structural products of things like ETFs and mutual funds and index funds that have made investing much more accessible to the average retail individual. So for today's agenda, we will, let's see, go for it. Talk about the history of the 401ks a little bit. It's very interesting, in my opinion. The importance of stocks and their diversification, bonds and their diversification. I will tell you, a lot of times people know a good bit about stocks and almost nothing about bonds. Then the importance of cash and where should that be in your plan. Certain contribution types, specific to AT&T, as well as some strategies in the, uh, port or the 401k. And then how to put that together into portfolio management and then eventually the growth of the investment portfolio. So when you look at the history of the 401k, and by the way, if you have any questions, you can do one of two things. Just interrupt me, or um, if you want to put them into chat, Juliana will be monitoring that. And bring them along the way so that they're relevant kind of to what we've been um, talking about um, as we go. So the history of the 401k. So in 1978, there was the Revenue Act of 1978, and that basically created the ability for 401ks to come into play. It was not intentionally created. And it ended up as being almost a type of loophole thing that was later found that in the 80s started to take off some momentum. And, you know, two things really happened in the 80s with this. One, you started to have the 401ks as a retirement benefit. So it took um, what was previously out of the employer um, benefits package of investing in stocks and put it inside of something that could be done with um, – just regular salary deductions, typically with a company match. And in the 80s, you really started to see just a shift, both culturally and, you know, both from intended ways and non-intended to where companies moved from taking care of their employees for retirement, i.e., I'm going to give you a pension and you're going to have that income for the rest of your life, to guess what, you're on your own, now you need to save. And if you look at the 80s, that's where we started doing a lot of downsizing, where we started having a lot of outsourcing, all these things that structurally moved kind of the responsibility of who takes care of you from the company onto yourself. It did not until 2016, and this just amazed me, become the primary savings vehicle for the average retiree in this country. It took a long time for that to happen. And then now we're pretty much all investing in it in some way, shape, or form and need to learn how to do that on our own. So when you're talking, how are we going to do it? The first thing we got to start with is what is an asset class? And so let's talk about stocks for a little bit. So you really have three main asset classes in your 401k. You have stocks, which operate one way. You have bonds, which operate another way. And then we have cash. 
And there are other types of retirement investments you could be in. You could be in real estate, you could be in commodities, you could be in uh, Bitcoin at this point in time. But these are kind of the big three, and quite frankly, a stock, for example, could even own some real estate. So, you know, instead of owning uh, real estate directly, you could own something like Simon Property Stock and, and get to that. But basically what a stock is, is you become a part owner of a company. And when you think of that, you think, why or how did that come into play? So let's take a company like Facebook recently that um, is, a, is a relatively new IPO. So if you think about a lot of companies, they start off small and they start off private. And as they grow, there becomes an appetite for either monetizing the value of that company to its founders or getting more capital to come in and grow. So AT&T is a great example on the needing more capital. Think about the beginning of AT&T or Bell South where, all right, we had this great idea, it's the telephone. Problem is we need money to build phone lines before we can sell phone subscriptions. Well, we need to get that money one or two ways. We're either going to sell part of our company out to convert that value to cash that we can then go use and build it, or we're going to borrow that money. And we'll talk about borrowing it when we get to bonds. But if you sell part of it, so you raise it in the, quote, equity market, what happens is now going forward, part of those earnings belong to the people you sold it to. And so that's why you'll see a company like AT&T pay a dividend, for example, because they earn money and instead of them keeping all of it, they pay it out to shareholders. Some companies, like an Apple, tend to pay their shareholders more by not paying significant dividends, but appreciating the value of the stock over time. So maybe your shares, you know, I'm making an easy example, are worth $100 and they go up to $125. So here's the good and the bad about that. First of all, Stocks make great stories. They're very exciting. When we get to bonds, you'll hear how it's not so much that way. But the down part about that is when you're an owner of a company, you really make more money when the company is making money, and you really start to lose money when the company is losing money. And so there's some pros and cons to stocks. So typically, historical returns in the overall stock market have been higher than that of cash and bonds. That does not mean over every time frame or through all recessions or every year. It just means typically if you hold them, let's say over a full market cycle, you're going to have a higher return in, in stocks. And another pro is they, of course, help companies raise capital. And without being able to raise capital, companies would really have um, you know, limits to their growth. However, the con, they can be very volatile. And so realistically, it should require a long-term time horizon in order to be appropriate. So let me define long-term time horizon because I'll often have people tell me something like, I just don't want to lose money. And who thinks, how do you think I should answer a question like that? Anybody? Um, we'll give out a prize for this, either chime in or um, into chat. Someone says they don't want to lose money. What's the first thing an advisor like myself should say back to them? Got to pay to play. I like that, Andy. And also, I see the question, Julie, on ETFs. I'll answer that in a second. Yeah, I like Andy's perspective there, got to pay to play. Perhaps avoid stocks. Perhaps. Oh, who, who said this? Somebody gave my answer. This is Billy Sibley. All right, awesome. And I hope you all don't mind me reading names if it's to everybody. Over what time horizon? That is exactly right. That is entirely the, the way to answer that. Because, you know, if you're talking every single day, you can't even own a stock. If you're talking over the next five years, I would say, okay, we can have part of your portfolio in stocks. And I can't ever give you a 0% chance that that would happen. But I can give you a very low probability and a very reasonable one to take, especially consider, considering um, maybe what is the biggest realist risk to your retirement, which is inflation, right? Things get more expensive in the future. And if your money doesn't earn interest or, or gain, you lose purchasing power. Um, so my belief on stocks is I want to put any money that I'm going to spend in the next seven years or less out of the stock market. And I look at times like the dot-com bubble, and this strategy would have worked. I look at times like the financial crisis, and this strategy would have worked. I look at 
really almost any time except for like 1930 to 1938, and this strategy works pretty well. And by doing this, where you keep anything you're going to spend in eight or seven years or less out of the market, plus a little bit of contingency based on your risk tolerance, you give stocks what is their formula or um, what is their, you know, recipe for success, which is time to recover. So best example I've ever seen in my career in life is um, last year. You know, if you were pulling money out of a stock portfolio in February or March of last year, you had a very different um, experience than if you pulled money out in October or November of last year. And on your financial plan, we might just have it listed by year what we're going to spend. But the truth is, even month to month can make a huge difference, and that's why we want to have that money out of the stock market. And then we need to also talk about, and this leads very well into ETFs, what are the different types of stock and different types of, you know, ways we can diversify this? And the reason I'm saying this leads well into ETFs is this is still in that asset class conversation. And I'll go ahead and go to the ETF. Everything you see here could be owned outright directly. I could own a large cap stock. You know, I could just go out and buy Google, for example. Or I could own it inside of a mutual fund, which pools it with other investors. Or I could own it inside of an ETF. Those are just structures delivering it. So if you think about like an ETF versus a type of stock or a asset class, think of it this way. The ETF is a plate, okay? On that plate, you can eat dinner. But it really depends on what you put on that plate to be able to say what your dinner tastes like. So if I take that same plate and I put spaghetti on it, I'm going to have a very different meal than if I take that same plate and I put chicken and broccoli on it. But it's still a plate regardless of what I put on top. What we're talking about is, is sort of the flavors. So we have large equities inside your 401k. We have small cap equities. We do not have any real estate in there, but you can get to it through Brokerage Link. We have emerging markets equities, and we have developed market XUS, meaning basically international equities. And even inside of that, and this is where I wanted to uh, whiteboard for a second, Juliana. Let's see if I can get this. There's something really interesting going on right now, which is sort of a rotation in the market from one type of large cap stock to another. And so I'm just going to draw, and you guys are going to have to bear with me and see if I get this right, drawing with a mouse. All right, so this is not um, not easy, but it's not terrible. So you've probably seen, most of you all, certainly if you've been working with us, you've seen this. If you haven't, you've probably seen it. You've probably seen something that looks a little bit like this, which is a style box. And typically in the style box, you'll have large for L, meaning large size. You'll have medium-sized companies, and you'll have small-sized companies. And one of the interesting things that happened with COVID is we figured out because of size and scale, large companies did pretty well in 2020. These guys down here kind of struggled. But it doesn't mean they're going to struggle forever. It just means they, they underperformed. Okay? Now I've used the word significantly, meaning now, all of a sudden, these up here are priced more expensive than these down here. And then in this side, you're going to have all through here, you're going to have value, full end, which is kind of a combination, and growth. And what you found is this did very well in 2020. Sounds right, 20. It's kind of fun. And this did not do so well over here, this va the value stuff. And so what you had is if you look at the past year, this outperformed, but then it got expensive. So think about this. You know, if a stock goes up 50% last year, it's probably more expensive than a stock that loses 5%. And what you've started to see is the reason you had that huge difference in growth is really it's COVID. It's COVID accelerating trends that were already under place, like, um, you know, online shopping and um, certain other, you know, web in ours and, and, and Zoom and things like that versus uh, other businesses that maybe struggled a lot. You know, obviously any restaurants and hospitality, travel, um, even certain retail stores, you know, because people aren't going in malls and things like that over here. 
And what you found is the story of 2020 was this, but this is over here, this value is turning into the story of 2021. And so what you see is, and this is one of the biggest mistakes you can make with stocks, if you do a um, past view, it would say, oh, I should invest in this. But if I do a forward view, I'm starting to see a little bit of a rotation from this into this. And that's one reason why looking at past returns is not always the best indicator of what will work in the future. With that said, any, um, I'll pause for any uh, thoughts or questions from you guys uh, before I go on to bonds. I hope that helped a little bit as far as what a stock is. Juliana, do you see anything that's come in? Nope, not yet, but um, I will pause if we do get some questions. All right, cool. So let's think about this guy for a second and realize how much more fun stocks are to watch on TV than these boring things called bonds. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and skip a slide and we'll come back to it. Um, this is a picture of my family one day when I was trying to teach my kids and wife about bonds and they just kind of stared at me because they were that exciting. So why are bonds so much less exciting than stocks? Well, guess what? One reason is they're predictable. And because they're predictable is one reason I like to use these for money I'm going to spend sooner than eight years. And so the difference between a stock and a bond, if you think about it, a stock, you actually take ownership of a company. With a bond, you're just lending, whether it be to a person, a company, a um, country, a municipality. And so think of it this way. One of the bonds we all have typically in our life at some point is a mortgage, right? And if you own the house, meaning you're an equity owner in the house, you have equity in that house, and the house goes up by $100,000, you benefit by 100000 However, if you're the bank and all you do is lend to somebody who's the equity owner so that they can pay you back at an interest rate, yes, you make your 2 3 4 5% on that interest, but that $100,000 in gain doesn't impact the bank at all. And so it, um, you know, when you look at it, it's a lot more predictable. Um, you know, think back to 2008 when uh, uh, real estate prices were going down. Well, all of a sudden, um, you know, if you were a bank and people didn't default on their mortgages, you still got paid your interest. But if you were a homeowner, your house might be underwater, you know, or you, you could lose you know, value there. And so let's take this in a business example. You know, if I'm a shareholder, let's say, in AT&T, and AT&T makes a bad decision like they did a few years back with buying um, DirecTV, well, guess what? That hurt their share price, and a lot of the shareholders over the past few years have been losing money. If I'm their bondholder, I don't worry about that bad decision because I know AT&T is strong enough to pay me anyway. And so the types of risk you're really working on with bonds is, one, default risk. Can they pay you? And if you believe that they can pay you, you take a much different approach than if you're actually scared that someone might default on bonds. It lets you invest in areas like high-yield bonds that otherwise we might not want to invest in. And then if you do a, um, if you do a, so we have the, the default risk, where as long as they pay, you still get paid back. And then the other is, is interest rate risk. And interest rate risk looks like this. Let's say I went to, and I saw a question that came in, which is why I kind of paused for a second just to see if that was good. I'll, I'll go back to that after we finish bonds here. Um, let's say interest rate risk. I lend to Juliana at 3% right now. And current rates, market rates go up and you know, a week from now, I can rent to, because um, he won the prize earlier, I'll use him, Billy at 4%. Well, guess what? Do I want to sit there and only earn my lousy three from Juliana, or do I want to sell that loan to somebody else, raise capital, and then go lend to Billy at four? Well, of course I want to lend to Billy at four. Four is better than three. And so that's called interest rate risk, because what it means is the bonds you're holding aren't as valuable as they used to be. And in your AT&T 401k, if you're invested in the AT&T total return bond fund, you are seeing this play out so extremely right now. And we'll talk about broker junk as a solution to that um, later on. But last year, rates went down, and so those bonds did fantastic. 
year to date, though, as rates have climbed, it's giving back almost all of those earnings. So it is absolutely, when rates go up, a totally different return experience. And this kind of leads well to the um, question that came in, which is about equities, but I can say the same on bonds. And the question is, is it true when you hear someone on CNBC or other equity advisors on news to always do the opposite of what they say? Um, I cannot say with certainty you should always do the opposite, but I can't say with certainty you should always do what they say. You gotta, I, I would say you always have to be um, consumer beware and figure out what their agenda is. Is their agenda to truly give you advice or is their agenda to promote certain positions that maybe they're invested in? And you know they want you to run out and buy them so they can sell them, um, which might be the case. And so I would say more often than not, I would advise people not to get their investment recommendations from the news or on TV, but it doesn't mean they're always 100% bad. You know, you might see some good ideas. Um, but what I would also say is, on that same note, and this is where I was going with bonds, a lot of times past returns can be every bit as deceptive as anything you hear on the news. So you look at past returns, and just because something did well last year, like your bond fund, doesn't mean it's gonna do well this year. In fact, it's probably an indicator that it's going to do the opposite. You know, I'll give you a great example with bonds. Interest rates aren't going to go down forever. And so if your bond fund does well when rates go down, well, think about it. When the U.S. 10-year Treasury, which is sort of the, um, you know, the, the main interest rate people look at when they think of the bond market, when the U.S. Treasury was trading at 3%, and it was yielding this back in 2018, 17 or 18, it's a lot easier for rates to go down than when it was trading at 0.5%. There's just more room it can move. And then when it's trading at 0.5%, it's a lot easier to come up with an argument that rates should go up than when it was trading at 3%. And so that's why these things kind of offset it themselves. Same thing with growth and value when I was talking stocks. You know, because growth did so well last year, guess what? It's expensive. Because value did so poorly last year, guess what? It's cheap. And so that's why you see money rotate from expensive places to less expensive places. All right. So let's talk about the different types of bonds and what you might be able to get to in your at and 401k. So there's a couple types on here that you really can't get to in the at and 401k unless you use Brokerage Link. And Brokerage Link just opens up your 401k to any, retail, any investment available to a Fidelity retail investor. But this U.S. fixed income in a broad market, that's really what you're getting in the at and total return bond fund that you'll have. High yield is a different animal. High yield basically says this, I'm willing to take credit risk in order to earn more. So think back on somebody with a mortgage. They have a bad credit score, they're going to get a higher interest rate than somebody with a good credit score. Um, high yield is looking at companies and saying, all right, obviously most of these companies do not have as high of a credit score as the U.S. government, so I'm going to require them to pay me maybe 5% while the U.S. government's only paying me 2%. And that spread in between lets you be more profitable as an investor as long as these bonds don't default. So that's where managing this, um, both through a manager like us as well as fund managers that watch that can be important. And also, what about going international? What about going outside the U.S.? You know, sometimes because credit scores are a little bit lower there, they might give you a higher yield or there might be other reasons, um, currency arbitrage and things like that, that those bonds can do a little bit better. So. Let's go into pros and cons of bonds here. So the pros, consistent interest payments, assuming the borrower doesn't default. And one thing I want to tell you when you're looking at bond ETFs and mutual funds, you have to remember what you're looking at is two things. One, you could look at your yield. So back to my loan um, that I gave Juliana at 3% and then the other one I gave Billy at 4 just because I can now lend a bill at four doesn't mean I lost money on that loan to Juliana. If I hold that loan to maturity, I'm going to earn 3%. I'm just not going to earn 4%, but I'm going to earn 3%. When you see your mutual fund, though, it doesn't reflect that. What your mutual fund reflects or your ETF reflects is what would the price of that loan be or that bond be if you sold it today? And if you think about it, there's a much different price to something if I want to turn it into cash today than there is if I just hold it to maturity. So that's where looking at those structures, again, can be a little bit, um, um, you know, they, they can add a little bit of complexity, a little bit of uh, fear unless you know what you're looking at, quite frankly. 
Sometimes bonds as a pro will have capital appreciation. I wouldn't plan on that too much right now, but if an interest rates get a little higher, that certainly could happen. And some could have tax benefits. So if you're in a high tax bracket and investing in municipals, for example. But it's on the con, it is credit subject to credit and interest rate risk, which is why it's still more dangerous than the good old asset we will go to next, which is cash. So um, remember, bonds are very useful. They're very predictable. You know, when I'm thinking about do I want to own stock, I got to think what is the difference in the business model between AT&T, for example, and Apple. Well, if I'm owning bonds, I really don't care about the business model as long as both can pay. You know, I don't care if you're Delta Airlines or you're Google. Your bond looks a lot the same because I don't have to think about your business model as long as I know you can pay. But if you talk about it too much at parties, people might look at you like this, like my kids did on me one Saturday afternoon. So any thoughts and questions on bonds before we leave? We had a question come in in regards to um, a 401k. So okay. I know that bonds are boring, so we'll go back to 401k. <laughs> um, is it a good idea to move money out of 401k to brokerage link in order to plan differently than AT&T plan in 401k? I really think it's a great idea. I think because of what I was saying in the stock market about COVID making some things priced very different than other things, you have some opportunities by going, you know, a little less um, just broad market and a little bit more um, potent right now. And then with what I'm saying about bonds and interest rates going up, there's almost nothing in the AT&T 401k I'd want to invest in on the bond side. Your stable value fund is a great tax, uh, excuse me, cash alternative, which is where we're going next is cash. But, um, you know, you don't have the bond stuff there. So, yeah, I would absolutely advocate brokerage link for most people. And that's something um, we can help the right people with. All right, cool. Anything else, Juliana? That's it for now. All right, so let's go to cash. So what's the point of cash? So first of all, you know, as exciting as stocks and bonds are, can you imagine if you walked into Kroger with a uh, stock certificate and you handed it to the, um, to the cashier and said, yes, I'd like to buy this six pack of beer with this stock certificate? Probably wouldn't let you do it. But if you walk in with some cash, they'll let you do it. So it's exciting because we can use it. We can um, go out and spend it on the goods and services we want to enjoy. And, you know, if you're at all like me, some of those um, services uh, sound a lot more fun after a year being pent up than they ever have before. I mean, I can't wait to go on some trips this summer. Woohoo! go vaccine. Um, and cash is interesting. And this is just a fun little, like, test for the group, and I was thinking about this with this slide. I used to be able to really tell you what cash is. I don't necessarily know as much anymore. So here's the question for you guys, and I don't know if I consider this cash or I consider this a security. Would you guys think, and just type it in the chat, when you think about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, is that a type of cash or is it not? Let's just poll the group. All right, you guys, for the most part, are saying not cash, but I am seeing some people that say cash. And, um, you know, it is interesting, Mary, yes, you do have to record a gain or loss for taxes, of course. Um, somebody just answered crypto, all right. Um, you know, and you also have to do that same thing, though, with currency trading if you do on and off currency trading. So. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, I, 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 jury's out on that. I, I really don't know. And part of it might be barter coins, love that, how people start using it or, or not. Um, the thing I would say is I think it's, if it is, it's certainly a much, much more volatile one than the U.S. dollar, which can work in your favor or against it. But anyway, that's outside the conversation. But since Coinbase is going public today, I thought it would be a fun question. But cash is basically legal tender coins that can be exchanged for goods and services. I mean, obviously, there's equivalents like a credit card. You can use a credit card and you know pay that later. And really, the technical definition is anything that can be 
turned into currency within 90 days or less, which is why the 90-day T bill is kind of the litmus of what the return on cash should be. So my advice for people with cash is maybe money you plan to spend in the next year or two, cash is a great place. Conservative bonds might also be a good place. Any extra emergency money you might want, cash is a great place. So, you know, look at your lifestyle. It's not always as simple as saying six months of, um, you know, salary. So, you know, that used to be kind of a rule of thumb, but the truth is if you're retired, you're already living off of something besides your salary. And I think that six month thing is more advice if you are coming through, um, you know, worried about being unemployment, employed and getting through that. To me, when I think of how much cash somebody should hold, I really want to know a little bit about your lifestyle. So if you're, you know, what do you spend $10,000 a month and you own one house, I don't think you need as much cash as somebody else who spends $10,000 a month but owns three houses. Why is that? You know, three houses, three times the chance of an HVAC system going out. Or, you know, $10,000 a month that you own five cars instead of two cars. Very different. So think about what you need and what types of emergencies could have, and then money you might spend in the next year or two. And the mistake I see since the financial crisis more often than not, and I see the mistake of people not having enough cash, what I tend to see is people having too much of it. And that really came from people, I think, being a little scarred by some of the pullbacks and things they've gone through with the market and just wanting to hoard cash. And, you know, a lot of times with that, and we'll get into contribution types, um, there are some better uses like putting that in your 401k or into some type of investment account than to simply hoard that cash. So, um, you know, like we said, cash is certainly fun. I mean, can you imagine walking into a club and doing this with, um, with uh, stock certificates? Just not going to work. But um, anyway, with cash, that makes it happen. And then, you know, is, and we're not going to spend too much time on that, but as a, a theory to all these, diversify. And cash tends to be, unless you go the crypto route, one of the ones that's hard to diversify because there's just less types. But um, with that, um, I will pause for questions. Okay, hold on. I got a great question here. For those with a pension, is this not a cash investment? Actually, um, and this is from Michael. I look at pensions like if I'm working with an AT&T person and they have both a pension and a 401k, I look at their pension as being a type of bond, which is one reason why, you know, if you're, let's say you have 500000 in your 401k and 300000 in a pension, you're a lot more conservative than you if you only look at that 401k allocation. And so I look at pensions being more of a bond because the yield is the most similar to a bond. But from a risk standpoint, I would say it's about equivalent the cash, which is makes that such a good um, kind of risk-adjusted asset. Um, and I am having some people just leave their pension in AT&T as a bond substitute because of that risk-adjusted return that goes with it. And then now, and good thing I can do my whiteboard a little bit better, let's talk about your basic contributions, supplementary contributions, catch-up, and then one other type. So. We're just going to go through the hierarchy here of how and where people should be saving their money. And let's hope this just all goes away fast. Well, okay. Apparently, I need to – there's got to be an easier way than that. Clear all. There you go. I knew there would be an easy way. All right. So we have basically your first 6%. We want to get the match, right? And they used to be called basic, and then there used to be supplemental. They dropped that language this year. Um, after that, we want to start saving money. Uh, don't know why that just went to blue. Oh, well. In our HSA. Now let's say max, and the amount you can max is a little bit different for everyone, so I'm just going to say max. The reason I mean that is, whether you're married or not, and what type of health plan you're on, and AT&T's match on that health plan. Then I want to come back to 401k, and we'll just say tax max. The 401k tax match is ba max is basically the tw 26,000 if you're over 50, 19,500 if you're under 50. And that's where the tax benefits stop. But after that, you can do 
after tax, and this is great, and this is where I wanted to tie this into cash, because if you leave money in cash or you leave money in taxable investments, growth is going to be tax-free. If you put it into the 401k, and you can do this up to $62,000, 63000 actually in some, um, it is a after-tax contribution, and the after-tax contribution can then roll out to a Roth. And then finally, if I do that all the way up to there, so, you know, 63-ish. And the reason I'm writing this, and these are big numbers most of y'all can't do off your salary, and then finally we go to taxable accounts. Except for if we're going to spend the money like I was talking about earlier, and that's a good reason for it to be in cash or some type of bonds. So if you follow this, a lot of people can't do this just from their salary, but if you go back to the idea of having cash and trying to do something better with it, you know, if you're a person sitting here with $100,000 of cash or 50000 or 200000 in cash, a lot of times from inheritance or sale of a property or just savings, you can do a structure like this and take that money that's in cash and get it working a lot more efficient from a tax perspective pretty quickly. And I've seen a lot of people do that and really benefit from it. Um, all right, so that is through the contributions. And we had a question earlier about brokerage links. So why do I like brokerage link and why I think it gives you a little bit more um, Benefit. So one, a wider range of investment choices and accounts can be managed professionally. Um, it may be possible, may not, to uh, reduce the internal cost of the funds, but if you're doing better funds or, or sometimes you, it's worth paying more for a wider variety. More control over what triggers a rebalance, so, um, you know, we make kind of manual decisions over there. And then finally, um, you know, do you qualify? And, and by that, pretty much everybody does, but you have to have a certain amount uh, in balance and then um, a certain amount in there, and, and we start helping people. But the main reason is this number one, wider range of investment choices and accounts that can be managed professionally. And this is a time where you really um, can benefit from that, I think. So now let's talk about putting together your uh, personalized plan. Talked a lot about determining your goal. You know, start with the time horizon in mind. When are you spending this money? Then what does that make appropriate? Then on top of that, there's the art of risk tolerance. So think about what I said earlier about the person's pension. And okay, I look at that as a bond investment. Well, that's great. And logically, it is a bond investment. But emotionally, you know, if I'm somebody who then can invest 80 20 in their 401k in a more typical kind of investment ride, more like a 60 40. I might not be the happiest or lose some sleep over some of those that extra volatility, and therefore it may or may not be right for me. Or I may be a person with a very good risk tolerance, and I want to work with David on some more opportunistic type positions inside of the brokerage link portfolio that we wouldn't use for an average person. And so knowing that can make a big difference. And then putting all three of these together is really how we come up with your investment portfolio. And when I look across our clientele, a lot of them use the same investments, but the weighting of those investments can be quite different based on these three areas. And one of the reasons we try to keep them using similar investments is you really want to invest in things you understand and know thoroughly. Um, you know, one of my favorite Stevie Wonder lines that always brings back to investing is, when you believe in things you don't understand, you may suffer. And so I'll tell you, um, for myself right now, I don't own any Bitcoin because the truth is I don't really understand it. And it might be the best investment and I'm leaving something on the table. It could be the worst investment, but I just don't understand it well enough to want to put my money there. Um, blockchain and the overall technology, on the other hand, I do get. And so I have a little bit of an ETF there and would advocate that for the right clients with the right risk tolerance. So I hope that made some sense. Um, you know, if you look at it that way from the investment portfolio, you're not always going to do the absolute best thing, but you can do the right thing for you. So back to that absolute best thing, I mean, you know, if we had known six months ago that Bitcoin was going to do what it did over the past six months, we would have put a lot of money there, but we didn't. And looking out to the future, I don't know what it's going to do over the next six months. So, you know, there's my take on that. But invest in the portfolio that you know can lead you back to your goals. And then one other reminder here, and I'm just giving you guys a public a service announcement on this um, before we kind of wrap up, is we've been spoiled. And certainly this is from 1988 till now. You know, this was a time period where people got a little bit spoiled. This was a time people 
time period where people really didn't like investing all that much and kind of got that spoiling, kicking them back to reality. From here to here, and then certainly here, which was March of last year, to here, it's been fairly straight up. And don't expect that forever, but also don't feel like when that changes, your plan needs to change if it's a thoroughly well-constructed plan. And all the things I've taught you today and, and, and preach would have worked through this time frame. Of course, they work better through this time frame, but it's not because the strategies are any better, it's because the world's better. And know that if we get into more volatility, one, a little more than what we've had already over the past year should be expected, that's totally normal. But two, it doesn't necessarily mean you're on the right track. And I think there's that danger right now. Um, and so, you know, as always, rebalance and monitor what's happening in the portfolio and do that on an ongoing basis, but don't necessarily always make changes simply because of fluctuations. But rebalancing and monitor is, it, monitoring is an, an absolute must. All right, so with that, I will open up to questions. And if you would like to schedule a review or a meeting with myself or one of our other advisors, you can use this QR code and connect with Juliana. She will put that in place and set that up. Um, I hope this has been useful and you guys have learned a lot. If nothing else, just you know, a public service reminder that markets go up, but they also go sideways and down. And when you give it the right time horizon, they're eventually going to be higher than they are. I think it's going to be very valuable for you guys um, after kind of this maybe, you know, spoiling period we've been in. But I will pause for any thoughts and questions from the group. David, maybe um, I have a question. So say that somebody wants to take a lump sum um, when they retire and they have a pension, how would you uh, encourage people to invest that in the market and what does that look like? Yeah, um, so the lump sum, if you're taking it out to invest in, and typically the reason you do that is just um, estate planning purposes. If something happens to you, you wanna make sure that goes to your family. Um, you can do it into an IRA and it's not a taxable event. And then I would just follow the logic of based on when you're spending the money, um, you know, allocating it between um, possibly cash, but bonds and stocks. And, you know, as far as whether it comes from the pension or the 401k, once it's in an IRA, that it's just, it's all money at that point. So it doesn't make a huge difference which one it's from. Um, I have one here about, I saw one that came in on thoughts on Roth IRAs. I think Roth IRAs are great tools, you know, when I talked about the spending, if somebody can, you know, take money they have in cash and move it into the 401k as after tax, this after tax money can actually go to a Roth. And so you can roll that to a Roth and build just massive amounts of money if you're able to do that. Um, and that's one opportunity I find over and over again, a lot of AT&T uh, employees are overlooking. And then the other thing to consider is when will you be in a higher tax bracket, now or in the future? And if it's a higher tax bracket in the future, then Roth is good. A lot of times that works for younger folks. Or do you want to do some Roth conversions? And a lot of times after people stop working and they're in their 60s, they've acquired good wealth, but they haven't started required minimum distributions, they'll do some Roth conversions because maybe after 72, those required minimum distributions will take them up to a higher bracket. So I think those are all great thoughts and ways to use a Roth, but it's not as simple as, yes, everybody should invest in a Roth. For a lot of people in their 50s and 60s, that's not the best choice. Um, I have, where do you see bonds as an investment in the second half of the year? Yeah, my, my crystal ball, and again, I, I do not have a crystal ball, but my two cents is I feel like bonds, a lot of them move up in interest rates. It might continue slower, but I don't see the 10-year getting much over two, and that's just a guess. But what I do see happening in the bond market is um, just it's not really rising rates, it's normalizing rates. So if you look at asset classes across all genres, they fell off a cliff when COVID first hit. And that's one reason we're seeing these huge inflation numbers is not that it's that much higher than it was two years ago, because it's not. A lot of our inflation numbers, things cost less today than they did 10 years ago. I mean, we might say gas, for example, 
price of gas has gone, gone up significantly from a year ago. Absolutely. It's still cheaper than it was 10 years ago. And when you see that in inflation not being out of the realm of historically normal, then bonds don't need to be higher than historically normal. And so I feel like when bonds went down so low, that was a reaction to the weird, weird environment we were in with COVID and all the stimulus. And then now they've just normalized back to where they were pre-COVID, like every other asset class, and they'll probably stay there a little bit. That's just my two cents. And so I'm more optimistic about bonds today than I was in January of this year, but I'm still not like running around like um, excited about them. Okay, and I have a, do you recommend signing up for Medicare if you're still working? I'm getting a lot of mail for Medicare, but feel like I must work for an additional two years. I would say, if possible, do not sign up for Medicare, because if you sign up for Medicare, you can no longer contribute to your HSA. Um, I've heard mixed bag on that from AT&T. Sometimes I've heard that people had to. I'm not 100% sure of that, but if you can avoid it, I would not sign up with Medicare until you actually retire if you're using the HSA, which, you know, unless you're on um, Kaiser or some plan where you can't do it, I think almost everybody should be using the HSA. Okay. We Anything have a question come in, and then maybe, um, maybe also, like, I know that people might be interested in speaking with someone. What is, like, um, what is the process if they do decide to meet with an advisor, and what kind of clients you're looking for, and what's the best services as well for using the QR code? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, we have different advisors, and Juliana will either email or talk with you to figure out who might be the right advisor. Some of it depends on your geographic area. Some of it depends on where you are and, and your, your process towards retirement. I typically work with people that are within three years of retirement and going to have a million dollars or more when they get into retirement. Um, but we have the right advisors to serve people, you know, as far as even 10 to 15 years out of retirement and, you know, start starting their journey. So. Um, I would say put it in, talk to Juliana, um, just know that part of the reason I, you know, put that threshold in place is just so we can all continue to provide great world-class service to um, the people we're working with, and, you know, we'd be happy to help you um, in whatever situation you're in. Thank you. We have one more question. What did you mean by after 72 and a half, consider then converting away to, from a Roth IRA, if I heard that correctly? Yeah, so I was saying after 72, it's not 72 and a half. It used to be 70 and a half, so I see where that half snuck in there. Um, you're going to have required minimum distributions that force you to pull a certain amount out of your um, H or of your 401k, regardless of if you want to or not. And for some people, that will jump them into a higher tax bracket. And if you're one of those people, you may consider before that, so typically in your 60s, doing Roth conversions. Um, and so what you do is you you keep cash flow projections going and you just kind of look out, okay, here's my expected tax rate when I'm 75, here's my expected tax rate when I'm 65, you know, which is higher and then make the decision from there. And that's something we do for our clients once they retire. Um, what are the four key points of, uh, excuse me, what are the four key points in the Fidelity brokerage link? Yeah, so to me it's, um, when I'm, here's what I'm looking for when I do brokerage link. One, what do we want to invest in that and this is different than what was on the slide, but I, I think these are more important. One, what do we want to invest in that we can invest in in the 401k? Second, if you know, there's still room after doing that, what can we do a better job of than we're doing in the 401k? Third might be how can we take what we're already doing, whether it's better or worse, better diversify? And then fourth would just be, you know, can we keep costs lower, and quite frankly, we usually can't, but sometimes there's an opportunity there. Great point. Great, those are really great questions. If you have any other questions, feel free to unmute yourself or um, type it in the chat box. We're coming up on the top of the hour, so I'll also throw out that you can reach out on a one-on-one -on -one basis for questions if you're not able to get to them here, but um, I'll go ahead and wrap this up. So we are very passionate about helping people live a life without financial regrets. And if you really think about it, even some of the most successful people you know have significant financial regrets. Um, and a lot of times that comes from not having a plan in place and, you know, not thinking longer than just the immediate year. You know, I think about my life and 
there was some time early on in my life where I, I was regretting certain things financially, but when I put it in the context of my life, I knew that I needed to spend the money on those types of things to get my family to where we wanted it, uh, for example. And now I look back on that time, this is uh, when my wife and I were going through fertility treatments, and I have zero regrets because, you know, at the time, it, it was a struggle. Now we have two beautiful children, and when I look at it, there's so many things that are more important than the money that, you know, maybe your financial regret, even though it's not the best thing for me financially, would be working another three more years and not spending more time with kids and grandkids. Maybe your financial regret would be going into retirement and having too much money and still not spending any of it and then, you know, passing on more than you intended. All these things happen, and we're here to help you be intentional and um, really, you know, live a very valuable life of significance. So with that, everybody have a great day.